When I look at somebody with prostate cancer, yes, I look at the grade, yes, I look at their stage, but I also look at the genomics of their tumor and what's the biology of their tumor because they may have a big, bulky, proliferating aluminal tumor, but I know a, it's exquisitely sensitive to testosterone suppression, which is something that I have in my back pocket, and B, it's less likely to start spreading to other parts of the body. Now let's talk about the relationship between testosterone and DHT and the development of prostate cancer over a man's lifetime. So one of the obvious statements is when a man has the most testosterone and presumably DHT in his body. So let's just take out the case of guys who are taking uh, five alpha reductase yeah. inhibitors. So when a man is in his twenties, you know, call it 18 to 20, 18 to 30, his testosterone and DHT are through the roof. We don't see guys getting prostate cancer. Yes. Um, Similarly, by the way, we don't see women getting breast cancer when their hours. estrogen is at their yeah. highest either. Yeah. So, so we know there's we know that the story is more complicated than the caricature is. Yes, which is not to say that these hormones don't matter, because to your point a moment ago, when you have men with metastatic prostate cancer or untreatable prostate cancer, hormone deprivation therapy is a core treatment. Yes. So, how do we reconcile those two observations? Well, it has to just, there's a time dependent co variable here, right? There's lots of things that testosterone does at a cellular level, right? It impacts um, damage to the DNA, repair of that damage to the DNA, all these different things that people I don't think really fully appreciate. But I think when you go through your surge of testosterone, whatever that may be, if your puberty, you know, your peak in, in, is at age, age 18 or age 25, wherever your peak is, I think you begin to reset the functional code. Right, so you're born with your DNA, but it's not really, for the most part, what's in your DNA that matters. It's the epigenetic, you know, changes that result in the RNA trans, trans, you know, location transition that really is the most important thing. So I think that you begin to mark and see differences in terms of the epigenetics of different genes within a test an androgen responsive organ that then sets the stage for your potential risk for developing prostate cancer, right? So I think that there's a correlation between testosterone and, and subsequent, you know, future diagnosis of prostate cancer, but it's just one of the many factors that plays a role. So if you don't have any testosterone, you're not going to get prostate cancer because you won't have a prostate, right? That's the obvious one. Yeah. But I do think that there's a correlation between T and A, being a healthy male, and part of being a healthy male is a potential risk for developing prostate cancer. Does that, does that make sense? I mean, it does. And then, and then there's this other very interesting observation, and I don't know if this has been subsequently refuted, but I remember this probably when we were in residency, Ted, that there was that paper that came out that found that men with lower testosterone, this was in the New England Journal of Medicine, yeah. were at risk for higher grade prostate cancers. Yes. The, the sort of teleologic explanation was, <clears throat> at least this was my teleologic explanation, if you are developing prostate cancer in the presence of low androgens, you have a very sensitive, you have a cancer that's very sensitive and therefore is probably much higher grade. Is that still kind of the thinking or has the thinking evolved significantly? Yeah. So we just published a paper on this. We, we looked at 100,000 prostate cancer transcriptomes. And we Where did- Where did you get so much We did this data. in partnership with the company, originally it was called Decipher, now it was, it's owned by a company called Verisite. Okay. And I did this with uh, the, the founder of the company, I've you, had you a, this with Eli, Eli DaVincioni, okay. and uh, we looked at their database of, now they now have 140,000 plus prostate cancer transcriptomes. Wow. So if you just, we, we just asked a simple question. If you take prostate cancers and you do AI-based hierarchical clustering, just looking for patterns, do you see different types of cancer? Not, you know, grade or stage, but different types from the perspective of the transcriptome of prostate cancer, and you do. So you see two general themes. One, you see luminal-like prostate cancers and basal-like prostate cancers. And then within that sub-classification of luminal basal, there are kind of effectively aggressive luminals. Explain to people the difference between the luminal and basal yeah. side. So, so I was gonna, I'll circle okay. back. Yeah, so yeah, you yeah. can see aggressive luminals and, a, and, a, and then aggressive basals and then less aggressive ones. So where is this all coming from? 
So if you take a look back at embryonic development, and you people have done this, I did this in my postdoc study, what happens to the prostate in a mouse or a rat when you begin to take away testosterone and give it back, you can see that the prostate, as we mentioned before, grows in response in part to testosterone and to estrogens around. But if you castrate a mouse, all of the luminal cells- Post-maturity. Yes, you okay. develop a normal prostate and you castrate a mouse or a rat with the prostate, it will regress. And think about it like, just like a plant in the middle of a drought, right? It looks dead, but there's roots that are still alive, yep. okay? Those roots that are still alive in the prostate are predominantly basal cells. If you give that prostate back its growth uh, fuel, testosterone or DHT, um, then it will regrow a new prostate and the basal cells uh, will can begin to repopulate and you'll get also a proliferation of these luminal cells that will then form the big, bulky, meaty prostate that we think about. Let's say, just think like a, a B, the BPH part mm -hmm. portion of the prostate. So you have luminal cells and the luminal cells in development, and we believe in prostate cancer, are exquisitely sensitive to testosterone's androgens, okay? The basal cells, the cells that survive the drought, the cells that survive in the absence of effectively any testosterone at all, yep. those are the ones that form more basal-like tumors, which are very, very aggressive, okay? So when I look at somebody with prostate cancer, yes, I look at their grade, yes, I look at their stage, but I also look at the genomics of their tumor and what's the biology of their tumor because they may have a big, bulky, luminal, proliferating, aluminal tumor but I know a, it's exquisitely sensitive to testosterone suppression, which is something that I have in my back pocket. And B, it's less likely to start spreading to other parts of the body. Why what? is that? Because it's, it, it's the, if, it, if think about because it. Because it's, it's on like, the basal side? No, if it's, a luminal, if it's a luminal type tumor, think about it, it's more dependent on that testosterone rich microenvironment with the DHT around. It doesn't do as well theoretically living in the bone marrow when it metastasizes to the bone or the lymph nodes. This Where is very it, counterintuitive. On the one hand, you're saying it's a more aggressive tumor. Locally bulky. But on the other hand, you're saying less likely to survive metast uh, metastatic spread. Yeah. If you look, which we've done, wow. the distribution of a luminal differentiated tumor in a localized state is about 40%. Okay. If you look at how many metastatic lesions, so you take tumors that are metastatic, it's only, it's less than 10% are luminal differentiated because they, they just don't have the capacity to survive and spread to other parts of the body. Whereas a basal tumor, which is by nature able to survive in the absence of testosterone and or uses alternate growth pathways to testosterone because it doesn't have, it's not, it's not dependent on it those tumors are more capable of spreading to other parts of the body. So this is kind of a great tragedy. It means that the cancers, the prostate cancers that are most likely to kill you, which by definition are the ones that spread, are also the most capable of thriving Abating. in a low testosterone environment. That's right. And therefore are least hurt by androgen deprivation. Yes. But, I mean, this is just, you know, things that we've been working on this thesis, Eli and I, for now a decade, but we have this data now that is, uh, we just published this year and lots of other interesting uh, studies coming out that really kind of support this idea. So that's why, in my opinion, I am very comfortable with a patient who is, have, has, who has a low testosterone being on testosterone supplementation if they have a low T either during the process of being diagnosed with their cancer or in their, their recovery phase. Because I know that if they were to develop a recurrent disease, a recurrence of their cancer, it's most likely a luminal type and we can exquisitely modulate that tumor with testosterone. So it's a big step. It's a big step in a different direction. It takes a lot to think about it, but it, in my opinion, it really helps us understand the biology not so much of localized prostate cancers, but rather when you have a localized cancer that has the capacity to spread. So a localized cancer with lethal potential. And what's the nature of that, of that tumor? How do you begin to attack it? 
and understanding the molecular underpinnings of it is key. That's precision medicine.